Hello, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to tonight's really unusual uh, seminar that we're just thrilled to have both um, our speakers here this evening. I'm Professor Matza. I teach here at SAIS Europe in both the fields of Latin American Studies and Development. As I see a number of my students here, we want to let you know there's a bonus for being here rather than online, and that is there is free food for uh, the students in the back, so casually go back when you would like. We have 15 people online. They might have changed their mind if we had told them they had free food, but they are now, you know, going to have to suffer the consequences. So tonight is a very special moment, at least uh, with our ability to look cross regionally, uh, both Latin America and uh, Central Europe. Um, Aldris Kerpek, uh, who will start the uh, presentation is an associate professor in international relations at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. His field is in economic history and international political economy. Um, he has written a number of pieces with Professor uh, Carol Wise. Again, uh, a very um, unusual and welcome for us a fruitful uh, partnership looking both at the role of China in Central uh, Europe and then back towards comparing Latin America and uh, Central Europe in terms of the origins of populism, which um, is very unique of research and we're really thrilled uh, to be here. I'm particularly thrilled to have Professor Carol Wise here. As she knows, I've been trying to get her here since at least, at least 2019. And there's always been some drama, whether it's COVID or her visa or something. So we are so thrilled to welcome her here today. She is a professor of international relations at the University of Southern California. Uh, she has written extensively on NAFTA, her latest book had been Dragonomics, the role of uh, China in Latin America. Um, and again, this new research that she's doing on the cross uh, analyses between Central uh, Europe and uh, Latin America. So I want to, so thrilled for us to have you both here. And um, as usual, we will have um, the, their formal presentation and then open it up for questions first from those who are here, and then as well for the 15 uh, people who are online. So um, welcome to both our professors. Thank you. So I will start with the presentation. Exactly. So I will stand. Yeah. You just need to turn yes, the red I will on turn because for the... Okay, so thank you very much for having us here. And I will try to, to present a paper that's work in progress. We are working on that uh, as uh, you just heard, my field is economic history and every question someone asks me, I start with 19th century. So <laughs> even today when uh, I, will, I will try to explain you know what we like like what we are thinking about the contemporary populism i'm of course focusing more on central europe but uh, you are much more interested in latin america so even the presentation will be focused uh, pretty much on latin america and i hope that in the end i will i will be able to wrap the story and it will make sense why these two semi peripheries we are actually putting together so uh, there is quite a lot of text. I hope uh, we will not get confused. First, the problem. The problem, how we are thinking about the problem. We have like two problems. One is the neo-populism in Latin America. The examples here will be Brazil and Argentina. And then there is, there is a, a, a twist in Central and Eastern Europe, countries which were considered to be like great example of deep uh, liberal democracy transformation uh, and uh, example of diligent reformers according to neoliberal uh, economic model. Uh, today, the, uh, today we have like populism in both of these semi-peripheries. 
and we believe that it is impossible to explain these developments without looking at the national state formation. And as I said, 19th century is usually um, is usually the the part of the the part of of the history and the time we have to get into the into the picture. So both region have of course unique set of challenges. They used different strategies, but there is similar disillusionment right now because they are not achieving their goals. And I will I will speak about something what I consider to be a liberal package in the Western view, and that's the combination of liberal democracy and neoliberal economics, uh, which were considered in 19th, at 1990s at least a winning strategy, something what doesn't have actually alternative, something what in semi-peripheries was considered to be blueprint for modernization, and actually the ultimate strategy, the winning strategy, but it did not deliver. And uh, to, to understand the interactions, we are trying to put at least on the contours, we want to put there also the other form of semi-periphery, and that, that is East Asia where the approach was different. The approach was strong state, national project, strategic independence. And, you know, in the process, getting agency. And agency is something what is really important for, for my part, part of the world, for the Central Europe. Because the Poland, Hungary, they crave for agency, to get the agency to be Ser serious respected part of Western Europe. That's the dream which is there for 200 years. And this is what was achieved by Eastern Asian, uh, Asian countries through, through the national project using national capital, not foreign investments, but national capital as uh, basics for the economic model and then gradual integration into world economy at, at the end. And that's the dichotomy, autonomous development against dependent growth. And that is what I believe Central Europe got at the best, dependent growth still. Now, what are the goals I'm speaking about in case of Latin America and in case of Central uh, and Eastern Europe? Your CEE stands for Central Europe. I will use Central Europe because we consider ourselves to be Central and not Eastern Europeans. Uh, Germans, does, does, do, yeah, they don't agree. They think that the Germany is Central Europe and Austria is Central Europe and we, we are uh, Central Eastern Europe. So uh, Central Europe and Latin America. So we are conceptualizing that that problems in Latin America, inequality, of course, regional disparities, and subor subordinate uh, position in international division of labor. And the strategic sovereignty only partially achieved and limited convergence. Now, the strategy is obvious. You are students and experts on Latin America. So it is export earnings from world economy, attracting investment, developing the backward uh, regions, and incorporating popular classes into the state to reach the strategic uh, independence. Within that, diversifying economy and building strategic branch of industry. Now, they tried almost everything, free trade and import substitution, industrialization, yeah, import substitution, industrialization built on state-owned enterprises, reintegration into the world economy and using foreign investments financing growth through central bank money creation and macro prudence and liberalization and populist mobilization, autocratic management, democratization. And actually still in the 21st century, the disparities and inequalities, they are still there. So what's left? Central Europe, the problem, dependence on foreign powers and subordinate position in European economy and maybe uh, uneven development strategy, obtaining independence achieved 1918, but then lost to some extent because of the Soviet Union uh, building the communist bloc in Central Europe, trying to build modern economy through emulation of the West, what they do understand to be the modern economy, strategic sectors of industry, not wealth necessary, but strategic sectors of industry and urbanized 
developed countryside economy. Uh, modern society, emulation of the West, strong middle class, the human high human capital public services. And once again, what have been tried? Uprisings against these foreign powers, international settlements looking promising, experiments with democracy, but also authoritarian regimes, Stalinism, reformist communism, neoliberal shock therapy in 1990s, and liberal, deep liberal institutional reforms, making them champions of democratization in 1990s, getting into European Union, into the club. But still, there is at least perception, if not reality, perception of limited sovereignty due uh, the membership in European Union and dependent development based on foreign direct investments. Just if uh, uh, you are not familiar with that, let's say that in countries like Czech Republic or Hungary, 90% of assets in like financial assets are, are under control of foreign banks. Maybe two thirds of manufacturing is foreign owned. What is like, like you know, incomparable with any other economy, probably industrial economy in the world. And the approach to this complex issue is historical institutionalism and historical analysis of semi peripheries. Now, uh, what we did, we tried to put together some historical sequences of these four economies: Brazil, Argentina. Uh, then Hungary and Poland. Just yet, yeah, we are not speaking. We, that the the point is not the empirical stuff here, but just to feel, just to just to see the sequence. So Brazil, after independence, continuity of the system: small land owning elite is is controlling the political system through patronage, export economy, of course, few commodities. That's that's that that's obvious. Dissatisfaction. Now, after some kind uh, of you know movements towards something, let's say more liberal, slavery abolished 1888. Then military cup, cup and old republic is formed. But still, the economic policy is unchanged. Coffee, rubber boom, yeah, till 1920s. Landed elite still controls the electoral process controlling the electoral process through limited franchise or bribery uh, and uh, stuff like that. Now, 1920s, economic crisis, commodity prices are going down, uh, price of coffee is going down, rubber boom is gone, and um, other countries in Africa and so on are more competitive in that. And it shows that immediately when there is external shock, and when there is commodity bust, there are problems. In this case, it leads to classical populism of Vargas in 1930. And how we can characterize the system, strong central government, state intervention in economy, import substitution, industrialization through subsidies, protectionism, state industries, state owned enterprises, but some kind of social justice, minimum wage, land redistribution, limited, but is there. The regime is authoritarian. No, uh, yeah, that's that's something what is very well known. And shocks, Great Depression, and then Second World War. After that, the situation is much more difficult. Military cop. Uh, Second Brazilian Republic. In that time, technocratic modernization, Kubitschek would be example, great example. That's the chance for Brazil. They are moving towards more export-led growth, working with foreign investors, creating some kind of dependency, investing into infrastructure. The economic growth is there. But popular reaction, because Kubitschek, you know, have opposition of rural elite and the left, and popular reaction, as always, would be the leftist, Goulart, supported by labor unions and peasants, social welfare problems, but basic reforms 1964 is triggering the conservative opposition, conservative reaction, military, and US backed uh, um, coup once again, and we have military dictatorship. 
conservative politicians, yeah, and that's that's obvious what the cleavage is here. Uh, Outward-oriented uh, economic policy with, with attempt privatize, liberalize, export processing zones, uh, and all these things which could bring Brazil between the group of quickly industrializing, growing, developing countries, but inequalities. Inequalities are still there, also environment degradation. And we are getting into neoliberal era. After democratization, uh, which is led by broad coalition of civil society, but also voicing some demands, which are some limits on the uh, on the ability of the government government to navigate the economic policy. Color, color de mello. We have new president, democratically elected president. Now, what is different in neoliberal era is that actually there is there is in in globalized vo world. It looks like there is no alternative to these neoliberal market prudence policies. And even, as we will see, even the left-oriented leaders in Latin America, like Lula, uh, they have actually to do market-friendly policies, as it looks like there is no, uh, no, no alternative to that. So in neoliberal window, we have democracy and neoliberal economics in the context of globalization as something what doesn't have uh, some sound alternative. And Color de Mello, as Cardozo, they are similar kind of practitioners, modern leader. Color de, uh, de Mello is considered to be modern leader who is modernizing the country and that will bring the Brazil towards the, the development. Turn to the left as the impacts on the poor of these uh, neoliberal policies is clear. Turn to the left, Lula da Silva, uh, yeah, champion, champion uh, of, of uh, the popular classes. He is making a lot of things correctly. Yeah, that is helping that we have programs like Bolsa, we have we have programs which is we, which are helping to the popular classes, but at the same time time he still does market friendly pol policies with high interest rates, for example, and that is actually uh, and that is that is actually very important characteristic for the countries during the neoliberal neoliberal window. Uh, this social spending policies are demobilizing those who would be otherwise uh, affected. The important thing is that this is all going uh, within commodity boom. So since, since 2003, during the commodity boom, we have like favorable external conditions. And because of that, it is manageable, it is sustainable. But in the moment when the external conditions deteriorate, immediately we have the same problems. We could consider the Lula da Silva regime as distribution without redistribution. He is distributing without taking the money from someone else. And that is that is uh, the, probably the only scenario when at the same time could economy run without excessive debt, without, without you know, uh, without hitting uh, without hitting the barriers and at the same time improve the standard of living of the popular classes. External shock would be co commodity bust in 2014. Dilma Rousseff had, uh, was elected with social spending program, but was forced as many uh, politicians in Latin America to uh, actually austerity policies and uh, together with corruption scandals, well, uh, lava, uh, Lava Yato and uh, other things impeached after that Temer's uh, technocratic austerity administration. And then we got into multi-dimensional crisis, economic crisis, political crisis of trust and credibility and crime rate, very high security crisis. And uh, that is why uh, the external, ex external newcomer Bolsonaro is coming there, like 
supported by right-wing conservatives um, groups, supporters of military government, dissatisfied groups. Uh, coming with eclectic economic policies, uh, stands on crime, attacks on women, minorities, LGBT, uh, interference with justice, conflict with media, and so on. Losing narrow elections, 2022, uh, uh, with, with Lula. Uh, and the same thing we can do, historical sequence of Argentina. Yeah. Now, why we uh, have chosen Argentina? Because Argentina would have lent to labor ratio, which is favorable, could resemble the lens of recent settlements like uh, like Canada or, or Australia. But actually, uh, the, the, the past was very different. Independence through negotiation. The national identity wasn't forged by the war for independence. I, it was underdeveloped economy inheriting the feudal system with small landed elite and conservative values of population because of the church having the monopoly on education. So when immigrants are coming into the economy, which is the eighth richest economy, a GDP per capita in the world, yeah, on the level of Switzerland by then, uh, the landed aristocracy already is in control of the resources. And uh, actually the immigration doesn't have the, 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 the same role of, of culture transplant like in uh, Northern America, for example. So the inequality and limited social mobility is already there. And in civil wars, the caudillos mobilizing gauchos. So that's example of, of absence of modern class conflict when the conservative, conservative popular class is uh, allying with this landowning uh, elite. And the cleavage is different than in countries which uh, improved pretty much and had the same conditions in uh, a lot of land uh, and expensive labor like us like uh, i already said the lands of recent settlement because here we have the conflict between between the port with income from events yeah from from trade of course but before even before from protectionism and smuggling and high prices uh, on one hand, on the other hand, the landed aristocracy. But uh, by, by that time, Buenos Aires was uh, trying to get deals with United Kingdom to get the investments in uh, for, in exchange for United Kingdom, uh, uh, actually uh, accepting the, the, the independence of the United Kingdom is very influential player and it's de facto colonial economy, uh, de facto, uh, colonial economy as quasi colony uh, of United Kingdom. So divided situa uh, society, but not modern class conflict. Since 1912, there is universal suffrage, some liber uh, liberal development, but still controlled by traditional uh, elite, uh, using the same instruments as we saw uh, already in case of, of Brazil dominating the parties, dominating media using election fraud so uh, the, the 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 democracy was not there still it was oligarchic oligarchic system and popular democratization classical populism uh, of peron clientelist state but improvement for popular classes but when the shocks came external shocks debt debt and inflation and the commodity busts making these policies uh, unmanageable. So we have like alternation, we have sequence of inward looking development strategy like Peron uh, and, and others uh, trying to modernize economy, make it more resilient, not only agriculture exporter, but also industrial goods exporter, expand the employment in public service, expand public services, increase the wages, secure through that national independence that would be classical populism also uh, but you know with this there is solid growth definitely in in this inward looking development strategy very often middle class is growing 
business elite supports the policies for supporting fair one at the beginning, but problems. The industry is uncompetitive. Uh, there is debt, there is high inflation. And after social unrest, we have regime change. And the regime change uh, comes from military, military with techno technocratic management, as there was several examples supported by elite, conservative elements, and also international capital. And under their government, we have economic reform. One example, newer, yeah, from the neoliberal era would be Macri, cutting Spain, spending, wage freeze, privatization, liberalization, and so on, leading to the uh, unrest and, uh, and, and that the pattern repeats, populist turn. So, uh, read of that. Uh, Argentina in low neoliberal era, we have wa Washington consensus package, liberal democracy combined with neoliberal economy as modernization without alternative. So the integration in the globalized economy, including, for example, the, the convertibility plan, pe pegging um, a peso to US dollar, will, that's the idea, bring prosperity, so solve all social issues, strengthen the legitimacy of the system, and as a bonus, there is inflow of foreign direct investment in favorable economic conditions, external economic conditions, like commodity boom. That's the example of Nestor Kirchner. There can be distribution without redistribution, but always elites take advantage from the liberalization. Uh, and when there is the commodity boom, there can be high social spending that is demobilizing the popular groups which would otherwise uh, raise up. But in the moment when there is external shock, commodity bust, uh, it is end of uh, this kind of economy. And even Christina Kirchner have to make some reforms and rethink the economic system, which is not sustainable. They are voting for fresh alternative, and that would be businessman, modern leader uh, Macri, coming with austerity, attracting investments, fighting inflation, but only modest growth. That is really disappointing, and it is harming the poor. So we have another alternation that would be Peronist Fernandez, strong populist appeal, social welfare policy, taxation of wealthy is trying. But, you know, the problem is that the economy of Argentina right now is stagnating. Inflation would be around 100 percent. And even and in, the, uh, in the government of Fernandez, his own finance minister is forced to do austerity. And uh, IMF is very happy about that. He's saying, OK, this guy is doing a good job. Will there, will there be another alternation like from left to right as we usually see all it's already time for anti-establishment uh, outsider like was bolsonaro in brazil we will see uh, on this slide okay okay on this slide we have uh, the sequence uh, for brazil the coding very simple red is a populist public expanding spender by the Felice Goulart, the alternation in then in the neoliberal time, even those would be, you know, trying to do both things at the same time, have sound economy and also, uh, also um, make concessions to popular classes. They are unable to do that. During the community boom, it is possible. Lula, then Dilma cannot do that. Another alternation to Temer. Temer um, is not a very popular leader. Dilma is uh, impeached. So we have multi uh, level crisis and then comes Bolsonaro. In case of Argentina, we have the sequence which we can trace, for example, since here, we had the green one, these are the military dictators. Red would be the spenders, the classical populist or neo-populist later. 
and we have the alternation here once again through neoliberal era we have populists here we former Peronist Fernandez and then we will see so that is the idea building these uh, historical sequences now example of Poland and Hungary two central European countries from very different kind of semi-periphery with uh, some kind of right-wing ethnocultural conservative populism and we'll, I will try to explain what the sequence is here to which is making the development like logical uh, and 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 explain it to a large extent case of Poland and case of Hungary in both cases first what we see is the the the, the clash with regional powers Poland probably uh, aware of that was was divided between Prussia Austria and Russia um, in the first phase of Napoleonic Wars and the Pol and Poland was subject of Germanization Germanization policies pro promoting promoting German language and placing uh, German ethnical uh, ethnical groups into elite position in Poland and Russification the other part of Poland which was under under Russia several insurrections finally finally failed in 1863 and they had to move into groundwork important thing what were the forces behind the independence movement peasants workers and national intelligentsia and church so these were the popular classes which were all the time pushing for the independence that's pretty important and I will get to to that uh, once I, uh, again ethnic conflict for Poles against foreign ethnically foreign minority Germans and and Jewish which were elites in the country that's the difference that's the difference because normally minorities are not elite in the country but they are they, they are politically uh, politic political economic and social elite and the ethnic conflict is suppressing the class conflict because Polish bourgeoisie is weak since 1918 there was independence but still the elites are reminding that they are in the country since 1926 there was authoritative centrist regime of Pilsudski uh, it was called Sanatia what is healing interesting feature is that that the leader Pilsudski is not claiming like official government position he is behind the scenes the mastermind of the political regime what what is very much like Kaczynski who is not president he's not prime minister he is mastermind behind that and he's choosing presidents and choosing prime minister after second world war the ethnic conflict please allow me to say that was solved yes solved by expulsion uh, uh and uh, extermination of the elites yeah uh and the communism communism which is very often considered to be the case of the problems of Central European countries is just another attempt in this uh, historical sequence to modernize the good thing about that is that the popular classes the peasants and workers are actually better off many of them most of them they are moving into the empty territories after the Germans was pushed to the west and they are getting into better houses better better facilities better fabric better better firms which are there after Germans have left into better farms so there is some kind of emancipation and actually uh, improvement of standard standard of living but loss of agency as Poland is subordinated to uh, Soviet Union in 1980s there were there was martial law regime of General Jaruzelski supported by Soviet Union then by uh, disintegrating uh, leading to the negotiated transition of power so in 1990s in order to secure independence the the modernization 
and agency, they undertook radical shock economic therapy, ter therapy uh, and attempted to be integrated into Western structures. They had to get into European Union, get into NATO. There was universal agreement that this is the only legitimate goal of policy regarding who won the election. Yeah, in the West, there was the, usually they were afraid that in a moment when the left social democrats, post-communists will win the elections, the reforms will be stopped. But they did, they never was stopped, actually. The leftist governments pushed further with the reforms because in neoliberal window, there was no alternative. Seemingly, there was no alternative to the liberal democracy and neoliberal economics. Now, in the global financial crisis, there is for first time, there is critical revision because we found out that we are still in semi-peripheral position, regardless getting involved in elite club as European Union and in subordinate position in European economy, where the development is brought by foreign direct investment. So reconsidering in Poland also the liberal democracy and progressivism, which is not priority for large part of polity, dead groups which are behind the independence and which consider themselves to be owner of the state. And the populism is, that's logical, yeah, ethno-nationalist versus immigration, versus foreigners, versus cosmopolitanism, which is saying that these popular classes are not actually uh, according to the standard of 21st century, is culturally conservative and is Eurosceptic as surrendering sovereignty to European Union was not definitely the goal. Uh, and the progressive projects like Green Deal or, or, um, or, or Industry 4.0 is not priority for this particular group. Uh, and the dominance of foreign capital is making the model even uh, economic nationalist. Now, sequence of Hungary to see that there is like big similarity in the stories, regardless there are also like big differences because Poland was partitioned between great powers. Hungary at certain time believed that is that is above the neighboring countries and that the aristocratic society. But there was crush of national revolt against Austria in the half of 19th century. And after that, Germanization. The settlement and dualism yeah, in the 1867 was a result of, uh, of failures of Austrian forces in Italy. And then they had to accept the division into Austrian Hungarian empire. By that time, Hungarians believed that they will be leaders of Eastern Europe. After the First World War, the Trianon Treaty is considered to be historical injustice. Still, in broad popular classes in Hungary, it is considered to be like you know something what is not natural. That superior nation, millions of Hungarians are now subordinate uh, into for the the bordering countries with. Uh, like um, inferior Slavic culturally, uh, Slavic, Slavic population. So the goal is to regain lost territory. That's important even in European integration project. And uh, it's important to understand that. Centrist authoritative Horthy's regime, Admiral Horthy is uh, like leader of, of centrist regime which is authoritarian, non-democratic, and is considered as Pelsudski regime, is considered the Hortis regime in Hungary, is considered to be very successful. So uh, the cleavage is rural regions and church versus secular urban class and intelligentsia. After 1945, there is in heavy industrialization in agrarian Hungary, that is improving the standard of living of peasants and workers, but the cost is loss of agency and subordination to Soviet Union. They even started like big revolt, uh, the nationalist revolt, beating the domestic communist regime in Hungary, but then 
crushed by invading Soviet uh, army. But that, is, that was leading to economic pragmatism, to goulash socialism, very soft socialism, uh, which is exchanging the fact that the people are not challenging the communist regime. On, uh, in exchange, they were granted some improvement in standard of living. So Hungary is entering 1990s with the perception that only gradual soft reforms are necessary to become, to become part of the market economy, unlike the problems which are facing uh, all their neighbors from the Eastern Bloc. In 1990s, to secure independence, trying to get into European Union, but they consider a large part of society was considering that to be uh, alternative for Great Hungary because in borderless Europe, you can reintegrate Great Hungary with Hungarians once again without a uh, need uh, of political conflict or, or stuff like that. So gradual economic left reforms, but that meant that they were lagging behind countries like Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Poland with shock therapy and much quicker economic reform. In global financial crisis, there is critical revision of the model of neoliberal uh, economy and market reforms because they found themselves still in semi-peripheral position and Orban is start starting the freedom fight. The freedom fight is against uh, European Commission, International Monetary Fund, foreign investors yeah, in order to secure more benefits for Hungarian popular classes, for Hunger Hungarians actually, to, to share the costs of adjustments between foreign investors and Hungarian population. And there is nostalgia for, for the aristocratic uh, uh, times and uh, for, for the past. The populism is logically ethno-nationalist, is culturally conservative, is Eurosceptic, yeah, versus political integration and foreign financed NGOs, and is economic nationalist versus dominance of foreign capital. Now, let's see, this would be once again the, the sequence. <coughs> yeah two authoritarian centrist uh, unique regimes still stood in Poland and in Hungary, it would be Horthy. Then it is Stalinist communist economy in, 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 uh, in Poland and in Hungary. In Hungary it would be only till the, the, the revolt in 1956, then in both economic liberalization and in both turning towards the outsider, the, the unorthodox policies, something different, what is more, what, 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 would, what would be promising in delivering the agency. Now, Latin America and then Central Eastern Europe, explanation of the populism. So integration into international economy through neoliberal policies in Latin America and pro-market reforms it's opportunity for the elite and upper middle class, but it is conserving the economic structure and failing to overcome the inequalities. Only those with, who have skills and flexibility can benefit from that and the rest is sliding down. Austerity further deepens the inequality problem, but because the democracy it is because the existence of democracy, the popular classes have the opportunity to vote for leaders who would increase spending, uh, initiate social progr programs and deliver public services. But that is manageable only when there are favorable external conditions and any shock is making that unsustainable, that inflation. And what is then convergence is unlikely and the dependent growth is what you get instead of independent development, what you want. In the era of globalization, even the left political forces sees no alternative to market-friendly policies. Uh, and, and in the context of commodity boom, as we can see in case of Lula, uh, you can distribute without redistribution and it is manageable, 
but immediately when there are problems in the in the world economy and the external conditions are not favorable you are forced to cut spending and there is frustration immediately and then can be repetition of the cycle like in case of Argentina maybe we'll see 2023 autumn or search for alternative like in case of Brazil and the alternative would be anti-establishment outsider smart someone smart who is coming with eclectic uh, economic policies who is pragmatic and who will make some 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 splendid isolation uh, of the country supported by white coalition of dissatisfied citizens and maybe centrist coalition he may attempt she he she may attempt to strengthen executive it would be similar to the model of central europe historical model and contemporary model dismantle institutional checks turn system into electoral democracy not liberal but electoral de democracy and just dismiss uh, the ideologies of left and right and speak about uh, serving the people in central eastern europe the rush to the west in 1990s which was universal and there was no alternative left and right governments they're rushing towards the West and doing whatever they were asked to do. But that was instrumental, only instrumental. It was to gain agency, not to surrender the sovereignty to European Union. And the history of Central Europe is full of reasons why the populism would be likely. Ethnic conflict, tension, uh, tensions to sovereignty, and and a threat from foreign powers yeah uh domestic solutions were usually like nowhere centralized ex uh, executive extra constitutional regimes and myth of their success and and uh actually the the integration into the western economy is making the inequalities which were gone because of the communism, re-emerge re -emerge once again. And now what, what, is, what is important for understanding what kind of populism you get, the parts of society, workers, peasants, and church, who are backbone of the struggle for independence are losing into globalized economy and through the integration of the part of the world into the West. They are losing and they are represented, uh, represented, they feel represented by centralized governments, strong centralized governments and centrist position, ideological position, Kaczynski and Orban who resemble Pilsudski and Horty. These countries are ethnically homogeneous societies and these groups always wanted to have control over state they consider their own so it is logical that they are indifferent to the issues of protection of protection of minorities of any kind ethnic religious sexual and the big biggest eu projects content for except for like supporting ukraine right now yeah but the, the biggest projects like industrial uh transformation and green deal this will this project will hit the most industrial countries using all the technology being in the lower segment of value added will hit harder and within these societies it will it will hit harder these parts these popular classes who were behind the uh the the independence so it is logical that this is at the very least not priority of these people and this here these are the general conclusions it is work in progress we are claiming that to understand the contemporary populism it is necessary to consider interaction of different semi-peripheries all actually including the core so latin american semi-periphery central european semi-periphery other semi-peripheries and and the example of East Asia, different pattern of development, as well as the developments which are in the core, because that together will 
that together have uh, the, the ambition to explain that on all levels of analysis using interactions between all groups of states. So in Latin America and Central Europe, in both these semi-peripheries, there is democracy and there is pro-market, there are pro-market economic policies and both are deeply embedded. The approach that these are just weak institutions and you have to make them make them more resilient, I don't think that it is as promising. And the same goes with first state and then democracy, and it would be better. Not sure about that. The economic reforms are repeatedly designed in tandem with orthodox economics and the resistance to distributional consequences are through democratic procedures. So democracy is working. It is not working together with neoliberal economics in semi-periphery. While neoliberal economy is promoted as effective, transformative, modernizing power, it does have tendency to preserve the patterns of division of labor and distribution of power. West is nowadays working hard to maintain the advantage in research development, high value added, high value, uh, high, high human capital, and in uh, the uh, international division of labor using sophisticated industrial policies and human capital enhancement policies. They are working systematically. They're using the, the, the smartest people, investing the most in uh, research and development to maintain the advantage. Uh, and how possibly, how possibly the neoliberal economy could deliver, I mean, economic convergence, full modernization, and possibly even, even alternation on the very top of the pyramid. Now, East Asia is different. It's, it's let's speak, you know, it's big generalization. East Asian variation, another kind of semi-periphery, but that semi-periphery, according to you know, our reading, is emulating the economic nationalism of 19th century West, not the recipes of post-Second World War reinterpretation of own history as, you know, as, as, as like free trade policies, comparative advantage, whatever will tell us, instead of being the most protectionist, United States being most protectionist industrial economy in 19th century, and Britain the most protectionist uh, economy probably in 18th century. Yeah. So, so East Asia is closer to breaking the pattern, uh, which is there because of the combination of democracy and neoliberal, neoliberal economy. So, so East Asian emerging markets and their efforts, like interesting, breathtaking efforts sometimes, uh, there are very important factor in changes in the West itself and in advanced industrialized countries, the opportunities uh, from globalization, even in the West are seized by those who have skills and capital and those who are lagging behind are exposed to competition with the emerging markets are supporting the populist leaders proposing heterodox policies uh, and pushing the proponents of free trade even in the West. They are pushing them, yeah, towards industrial policy and economic nationalism rhetoric. So this all is legitimizing the neo-populism in the periphery, logically, and it's plausible that it will be emulated under specific conditions of semi-periphery, where all the problems, failures, and aspirations are stronger. So it will be exaggerated. And that is actually uh, our thinking about the issue. Thank you for attention and now we will probably continue with the questions yeah. okay thank you very much first thank you so much that was so fascinating because we tend to focus so much and talk about neo-populism as a modern phenomenon rooted in globalization uh and uh social media, you know, the way that the instruments of neopopulism are, are different, but I found it really fascinating to pull it back and look at these historical uh, roots and the 
long-term uh, aspirations. So uh, thank you very much. It's a really fascinating piece. And to bring in East Asia at the end is really ambitious. So I, I hand it to both of you. I don't know, Professor Wise, if you want to mention anything before we open up for questions or just open up for questions. No, the audience has been very patient. Why don't we go to Q&A? It's a big, quick, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big thesis. So open up for questions and, you know, from my students, if you would introduce yourselves and um, what your, uh, you know, uh, country of origin is or background, that would be helpful. Yes, go ahead, Enrique. Uh, I think we, we will we hear you. Yeah, if you stand up, stand up, we can it's hear not you. not that big. Yeah. My name is uh, Enrique. Okay. I see. Uh, my name is Enrique. I'm from Mexico. And I'm just curious about, like, you know, we see, like, the race population, like, in Latin America throughout the 20th, 20th century and also throughout the 21st century. So I would be curious to know why do we see in Latin America, uh, a left-wing populism rather than a right-wing populism in Latin America. Uh, I was just like throughout the presentation trying to go like through like a map of movies or like a map trying to think about any right-wing populism in uh, Latin America. I'm sure there may there there might be some cases, but not like as successful as like Chavez in Venezuela or like. I'm in Mexico, Lula in, in Brazil and Argentina also with uh, their uh, president, now Colombia with Petro. So I will. Yeah. So why don't um, I'll take you this. the American version where you answer uh, the question that's asked in Latin, in Latin American forums? You will have the you know the nine questions first, and that enables the speaker to. Uh, uh, answer only the questions they want to answer. So you go ahead and answer Enrique's question. No, it's a great, it's a great question. Now, my colleague, Aldrich, talked about um, getting to a point where it's populist, but it's not really referring to left or to right. Uh, it is, uh, okay, AMLO, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who is the president of Mexico, uh, has engaged brilliantly, not to the benefit of the nation, I believe, but brilliantly uh, in this very single-minded uh, forward march of if he doesn't like it, he doesn't do it. And it isn't clear why he wants to build a new airport next to the old one, right? Or why he wants to fiddle with the electricity sector to the detriment of the electricity sector. And there's so many things like that. Uh, the worst thing right now is his... Um, intervention or his attempted intervention into this uh, electoral agency institution, which it was a very big triumph of Mexican democratization. The Mexicans were so proud that the 2000 elections, the first true competitive elections, were the cleaner than the elections in the US. If you recall, Bush, Gore were fighting it out for three months. So I think we're in, the, in many of these countries I think, you know, Petro uh, in Colombia, um, Boric in Chile, all these left-wing leaders have been uh, elected. But if you look at, they may have used the rhetoric of left to get elected, but if you look at the, the, the sort of march forward, Boric's having a lot of trouble, right? I mean, he rewrote a constitution with the Congress that favored indigenous people and 70% of indigenous people rejected the new constitution, right? So that's a very difficult terrain uh, for a leader. And I believe all these people are, are, are good leaders, uh, but it's a very difficult terrain. And I really think, I'm not trying to cop out with your question, but I really think it's not that they lack left or right. It's that they're getting spun around uh, by some unexpected responses from civil society, including ethnic and racial groups. And it, it is, especially now after COVID, uh, this U.S.-China trade war, et cetera, I think right now um, it's, uh, okay, that didn't work. I've got to do something else. I think it's really hunt and peck. In Mexico, 
Um, we can talk afterwards if you'd like, but in Mexico, it's complicated by the fact that someone that ran for office three times, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, on the left ticket, who finally won, who for the first time of any executive has complete control of the executive and the Congress, both houses, right? And has squandered that kind of uh, control, uh, broken promises, squandered it. And that is something I'm not sure just political analysis or economic analysis could, could explain. Uh, it, it's just, I think it's, it's really um, been quite difficult and puzzling for the Mexican people, right? We don't have another question just right. I really wanted to sort of take up this point. And first, if you would allow me to reuse your distribution without redistribution uh, line, because I think it's really telling, particularly for the Latin American case, that is that even though we've had a, a almost a generation of conditional cash transfer programs and uh, but it has not fundamentally altered inequality. And I think that was so exciting about your research. And back to Professor Wise's point about even when the Constitution is rewritten, the faith in the ability of the political system to deliver on inequality is still questioned no matter what they say or do. And that's where I was just wondering where um, is the question both of inequality in the um, Central European case and inequality in the Latin American case, is it so fundamental to how neoliberalism in, in essence uh, portrays itself? I, I'll say one thing. This this is my data meister here. Um, <laughs> we met in 2019 when I was a visiting scholar at his university in the Czech Republic. And um, he's just fantastic. The, just all the data. So part of the data diving has been uh, coming up with dis, uh, indicators of distribution, well-being, per capita income, whatnot, across these four countries, actually more CEE Latin America analysis, but especially this. And so the finding is still anathema to the West, all right? The finding is that uh, for all their troubles and all of their woes, that the Central Eastern European bloc, and that includes, in our case, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland, have done better. They've done much better. Um, if you look at the period from, say, the, the 50s all the way up until today through, you know, the, the shock, the market shock treatments of the early 90s with Jeffrey Sachs, you know, running in and, you know, doing these big uh, market miracles that flopped, right? Uh, you look at all the ups and downs, um, the two big indicators, which would be per capita growth over time and aggregate growth over time, but there's so many others like uh, skills, education, uh, health indicators and whatnot. And Latin America has just done much worse. So um, these are semi-peripheral countries. They could always do better, but they're not the same at all. And I would so is this a debate over communism versus capitalism? And in a way it is. Uh, but in another way, um, the goulash, uh, you know, Hungary's goulash uh, communism and, and whatnot. But all three of the countries had enough of a social safety net laid down during the communist period so that as they move into the you know, market shock treatments and whatnot, there, that has not been completely eradicated. And over time, you have seen much much higher growth in per capita income, which is super important, um, and much higher levels of per capita income versus uh, the Latin American countries. And I think in the Latin American countries, the really most, and I'm the Latin Americanist here, the really most painful thing has been uh, the flipping and flopping back and forth, the market shock treatment, and then the intervention. And since the 90s, it's been Aldrich mentioned uh, briefly this macro prudential approach. So since the 90s, we have seen in Brazil, Peru, Chile, and to a certain extent, even in Argentina, um, a pattern whereby 
they maintain what would be international monetary fund, you know, monetarist policies of tight, tight spending, tight, tight, um, you know, high interest rates, uh, you know, competitive interest rates, uh, exchange rates, and all of that on the monetary side. But on the fiscal side, they've been profligate, right? That's what brought the the convertibility plan down with the peso dollar peg that the, the fiscal recklessness in the regions uh that's what brought the brazilian real down in 1998 1999 so it's this half-baked um uh, uh management approach where just today i was looking just to update for tonight uh in the financial times uh, the Chileans are bragging they have a budget surplus. The Colombians are going to have a budget surplus. And I don't think, I've got a smart economist here, we'll see what he says, but I don't think developing countries should run a budget surplus. That is really uh, counterintuitive. So, I mean, they're capital scarce, right? Uh, so I think Latin America, it's been, you know, if there is an ideological um if you will hegemony it's been capitalism 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 the market the market the market and the other pattern which hasn't been perfect but the pattern of socialism communism whatever in these eastern european countries or central european countries um since say the 50s and 60s has been more successful uh, I'll, I if I may. Yeah, I want you to answer that, but we have one other question to add. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. I, I, I have. Yeah. May I? Yeah. Would, oh, I was. It might factor into your answer. Yeah. I was curious. I feel like the success of Poland and Hungary also has a lot to do with the economic patronage of Germany, and again, the USSR during the Soviet Union, uh, that helped keep these economies stable and industrialized. And I don't feel like there's as much uh, patronage relation. I mean, you talked about the UK. In the 19th century in Argentina, there's, you know, historically discussion of the U.S. and Brazil over the 40s and 50s. But I'd say that immediacy, that role of, of Germany, yes, it's a lot of foreign owned firms, but people have these manufacturing jobs and the economies in Central and Eastern Europe have been growing. And I feel like the foreign investment is very scared of Brazil and Argentina for various reasons that it, there's not really an outside political economic interest in keeping them stable and growing the same way there is for Germany and the EU to keep the Central and Eastern European countries on the stable track. And I know Professor Colbert was busy writing to answer the last sure. question. So I'll let you start there and we can go back and forth, but I wanted to bring in this new yeah. question. Yeah, so so just probably two two remarks. Um and and I will I will even I, I would ask even to 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 speak about the Germany. Uh, Interesting is that Central Europe probably have the lowest level of inequality in the world. And it was like this indicator would be the best at the beginning of 1990s. The point is that even though it's very, very nice level, it is increasing. It is increasing for 30 years. And uh, the point is that for large part of population, those who are taking the advantages from being integrated into uh, European economy into the Western European uh, economy, they are traitors. They are someone who are like, uh, who are teaming with the cosmopolitan EU. And uh, it is this is actually channel by which the foreign capital uh, is once again regaining the dominance in the region. Uh, for example, the presidential elections in Czech Republic um, like 10 years ago, uh, it was won by Zeman, one of the most pronounced of supporters of China and Russia, even in New York Times, several times he was mentioned what is very unusual for someone from Czech Republic, but in, in the bad connotations, of course. He won the elections just because he said that the Schwarzenberg from noble family, he is German and uh, he will be instrument of Germans retaking the border region's property, yeah, which were lost uh, in 1945 because they were expelled. So, so this issue is like, like very, it's, it's a lie. Now, the investment, of course, this is great. 
this is great. Yeah, investments coming from the Western Europe and especially from Germany, that's a great thing. But uh, it is, but but the, the still who owns the property matters and you will discover always during the economic crisis. During the global financial crisis, the Czech firms were the most profitable in OECD countries. Yeah, because there were conservative investments by um, Austrian, uh, Dutch, but especially German capital. And they were from the affiliates taking the dividends yeah, out of the out, keeping the wages low, getting the money out and uh, saving the balance sheets of the of those firms. And that makes you think uh, how possible is to get from the division of labor because the German investments, of course, they definitely want the, regi uh, the, the, the region to be prosperous, democratic, sound, and, uh, and so on. But actually the Western European countries were using the Central Europe and that's rational, logical, it's okay, uh, to remain price competitive uh, in competition against Asia. And uh, that even was harming the Southern Europe because before that, they were playing this role to uh, keep the Western, Northwestern European firms to be competitive against the first generation of emerging markets. Now we took, uh, took the jobs from them and that is actually a big part of, the, of, of what is going on in the South Wing of European Union. And uh, one short remark to the issue of the right wing and left wing populism. Obviously, in Central Europe, if the big issue is not uh, wealth and inequality, but it is the control over its own policy, its own territory, its own nation, then it is more right wing populism than in Latin America. Uh, where the, this is not an issue. But if you want to be populist and don't crush democracy, so be so just move from from the liberal democracy towards the 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 electoral democracy, you will need to move into the political center in Latin America and in Central Europe. Otherwise you cannot win the elections. You have to be in the center. So it is it is like saying, okay, I'm smart, I don't care about left and right ideology. I will come with new, perfectly suited for our case policies, and it will be it will be set. So, can I just say yeah. something now? I think you two, young scholars sitting in the front, told me you were with the European Studies Program. <laughs> oh, Central Europe. <laughs> well, there we go. Well, let's hear it. How? I mean, how does this resonate with you? I'm turning the table. Yes, that's, right. that's a, what professors do. This is a problem. American, <laughs> American professors do. Um, yeah, I was just corrected. American <laughs> professors do that. Um, I have to say, like, for my bachelor's thesis, I actually looked at, like, the role of property rights in the post warsaw Pact uh, countries and how they impacted the economic development after the 1990s and why you see differences, for example, in Czech Republic and in Russia and Ukraine today. Um, and what I was interested in, because I don't know that much about Latin America, um, if you saw or if you looked for that as well, like property rights, how they impacted Latin America or which role they play there. I shouldn't have called on you. <laughs> I should have let it go. <laughs> so it's a really good, no, it's a really, really good question. I and mean, then you're not going to believe this, but this uh, Washington consensus, the eight, you know, 89, 90, um, countries like Peru, 1992, this is when they finally laid down the legislation for foreign investment in mining and natural gas, because they had discovered a big natural gas field up in the Amazon. 1992 and property rights has everything to do with who's going to come and invest even if it's domestic investors right and so i have to say in the latin american case uh it's been evolutionary it's spotty like you know they had a perfect law in electricity in peru nothing in mining and it 
wasn't taken very seriously until quite recently. The 90s became the decade of property rights. But let me just say, uh, you're seeing right away, you've got um, Ecuador nationalizing some of the companies in the Amazon. You've got Venezuela doing that. Uh, China comes and saves them. Uh, their property rights are down the tube, right? But China has a way of dealing with them that they can't abandon them because of the oil for loans deals. So uh, it's been very sloppy. And I'm not a, a, an expert on property rights by any stretch, but my understanding just in becoming a budding Central Europeanist is because of the, you know, the 1989 transition, they were, all of these things, property rights, transparency, rule of law, became essential to draw the line between pre-89 and post-89. Post For Latin America, it had been, you know, kind of groping and wandering and the lost decade of the 80s. And then, oh, now we're going to open up uh, and, and try to attract private investment because we've been so, you know, just so, so poorly. Uh, the performance, performance had been so poor. So I have to say that my region of expertise it's fairly new. Now, Mexico in the North American Free Trade Agreement, now they call it the USMCA, property rights were essential or the US isn't gonna let them in, right? Um, Chile, it was essential to them as part of coming out of authoritarian rule in 1990. So you've got like very, there's no solid kind of theme or narrative. It's very patchy. And the countries that are doing better um, have gotten a much more, if you will, professional, uh, transparent property rights regime. Good. I wanted to um, kind of end with a little more in formality. If any of you, since we still have free food for our students, you're welcome to bring up some food and come and ask informally questions of both professors. But I really want to thank them for a really uh, dynamic and fascinating. Thank you so much. And we really look forward to keeping up with your work and uh, learning about it, because I think it's really central to what's happening today. Well, we're delighted to be here. This is a big thing for us. So. <laughs>